welcome to the 47th CMS Pensions Lawcast. My name is Mark Atkinson and I'm a partner in the CMS Pensions team. I'm joined on this Lawcast by Simon Evans, who's a senior associate in our team, and together we're going to look at where we are with the Pensions Regulator's Draft Funding Code. The Draft Code is important for all trustees and sponsors of defined benefit pension schemes because it sets out the basis on which the Pensions Regulator expects to operate the new developments in funding and investment law that have come out of the 2021 Pension Schemes Act. It's also an opportunity for the regulator to update the industry on how it intends to apply the broader funding legislation that's been in place for some time already. Of course, this isn't the first go the regulator has had at an updated funding code. And to be fair, the position is complicated because it's intended to sit alongside detailed new funding regulations. Those were consulted on between July and October last year, and we still haven't seen the final versions. Some of you may even remember the original draft of this code back in March 2020 and the regulator's interim response in January 2021. Obviously, a lot's happened in the world generally and in pensions since then, so you should really see this draft as a clean sheet. Looking forward, we promised the final regulations and code in mid-June, with the intention of them formally applying for all actuarial valuations with effective dates from 1 October 2023, that will come round soon enough. So what are we going to do for this session? Simon and I will take you through the bits that we think are most interesting. He'll start with the areas of the code most closely related to the regulations. I'll then comment on those and touch on the difference this code envisages for covenant advisors. Simon will then look at how some of the regulators intended processes may impact the substance of how valuations conclude and identifying what important elements we can see about how the regulator will act in the future. Then I'll wrap up. So Simon, what are the key areas where the draft code would build on elements of the new funding regulations? Thanks, Mark. Well, a lot of the content of the draft code is very actuarial. It's not something you want to listen to lawyers about, um, but it is helpful to understand some key implications of concepts in the regulator's code. The first one to understand is the concept of the low dependency investment allocation and the low dependency funding basis. The low dependency investment allocation is the position that schemes should be targeting to move to, where their investment mix will have a high degree of resilience. The low dependency funding basis is the liability figure produced on the assumption that the scheme has moved to this investment allocation and has adopted actuarial assumptions that together mean that there should be no need for further employer contributions in what the regulator calls most reasonably foreseeable scenarios. The assumptions may well be more prudent than the scheme's current technical provisions, so the low dependency figure may be higher than the scheme's liabilities on a technical provisions basis. The low dependency funding basis is agreed between the trustees and the employer. However, for schemes where the trustees have a unilateral power to set the technical provisions and only need to consult with the employer, this is also unilateral trustee power. This isn't just a green light for hard-nosed employers to negotiate it down, though. The DB funding code sets out a number of the pension regulators' expectations about the assumptions used here. The potential for challenge by the regulator will therefore constrain the room for manoeuvre. For schemes outside of the fast track, which I'll discuss a bit more later, this is also more about the way that the assumptions are set rather than specific figures used. But as we will discuss later in this lawcast, potential challenge from the regulator can make the fast track figures relevant for schemes in any case. The second key concept I want to talk about is significant maturity. The point at which the scheme reaches significant maturity is important because, it's, because it is the target date which schemes should be aiming to have moved to the low dependency investment allocation and be fully funded on the low dependency funding basis. More specifically, it's actually the end of the scheme year in which the scheme is expected to reach significant maturity. And that is the latest date schemes can use. They may target being on the low dependency funding basis at an earlier point. The measure of significant maturity is, on the current proposals, intended to be a figure in years, which is the average duration of the scheme's remaining liabilities with weighting and discounting. It's important from our perspective to understand who has roles here. Firstly, under current proposals, the minimum figure for this is set by the pensions regulator. 
we just set out the draft code, this should be 12 years, but schemes should be aware that we could see this being revised in the future. In any case, we may see further tweaking to the definition and threshold setting power when DWP reveals the final regulations this year. Next, calculating the scheme's duration of liabilities is a function performed by the scheme actuary. But the scheme actuary will be using the assumptions that have been agreed for the low dependency funding basis. As I said before, these are agreed by the trustees and employer, but they're doing so in light of the detailed expectations set out by the regulator of what they should do here. Now, I know Mark has got some views on this area too. Um, if you could care to let people know, Mark. <laughs> yeah, um, a few comments there. The first of those is what the regulator sets out in its code, much of which is very actuarial, is really important, and it's an area where the actuaries will be to the fore. If it gets difficult, though, the binding rules are set out in the regulations. That's where you'll find what the law says, not in the code. And a number of these actuarial concepts are now written into those regulations. At some point, these will come before the courts. So it's important that whatever approach is taken in negotiations is not just actuarially compelling, but it's also something you're sure can be explained to a court. And frankly, that means you'll have to be able to explain it to your lawyers first. So it's good to do that at the time rather than after the event. Another comment from a lawyer on what we're seeing here is in relation to investment change. Uh, Simon's explained the low dependency funding basis is a key concept for the DWP and the regulator, but a fundamental building block of that is the low dependency investment allocation. Now, it's been a tenet of pensions law over decades that trustees control investment matters. They control them, they're responsible for them. And the government's always said that it's not looking to change that. And even in circumstances where in the past the government has changed the balance of power related to funding, it's maintained that position. It still says that's what it's doing. But actually, introducing the requirement that Simon explained for sponsor agreement to concepts such as the low dependency funding basis, which means also the low dependency investment allocation, is really muddying the waters there. It's not perhaps an issue for lots of schemes where the trustees and employers have got common ground, but I'm afraid that's not all schemes. But the draft at the moment contains some effectively sophistry uh, and the consultation paper that accompanies it isn't much better. And they're contrasting the long-term objective, which has to be agreed, and day-to-day -day decision making, which they say is the trustees maintaining control. Uh, but be under no illusions, this is going to be an area where there will be very early tension and potentially the, the need for judicial comment. And the last of the areas I just wanted to comment on here in, in substance is in relation to employer covenant. So for some time now, quite sensibly, the regulator has looked at three pillars as being very important for the security of member benefits. First of those is funding, the second is investment, and the third is actually the employer covenant standing behind those two things. The draft code contains a lot of new material on the covenant side. Uh, it's much more granular, both on what the regulator thinks uh, should be looked at in covenant itself, but also, and this is really important, on the impact of that covenant on the other two concepts. We're still waiting for more material about covenant, which will be interesting when we get it, but we do know that we'll hear much more about the visibility of covenant, the reliability of covenant, and the longevity of covenant. Three concepts that I don't think have always been teased out from each other in the past. And the importance of looking at those on those three bases is that it will feed into what the regulator will accept as things like being the maximum supportable risk for a scheme. And that will feed into the time scale for the journey plan uh, that we will be looking at as underpinning valuations and the amount of contributions going forward. So all of that, I think, is going to make Covenant a, a big leap forward over the next year or so. So we know there'll be more on Covenant and we still have a tangle on how the new legislation will impact on the balance of power of investment. Um, but I think, Simon, just if you were able to finish off with what we do know about regulatory changes that are proposed and how we think they may also affect the substance of things. So more about process and how that will affect things. Thanks, Mark. Well, I mean, the process we want to talk about here is this other key concept from TPR, which is its fast track approach. This doesn't feature in the legislation, but it's part of how TPR plans to practically regulate the area. 
The fast track approach involves minimum parameters and assessments on risk, which are set by TPR. These reflect risks that TPR will tolerate. What it's doing is acting as a filter where schemes adopting fast track parameters may be less likely to have their valuation scrutinized. It's up to the scheme actuary to certify if they've complied with the criteria. This is a move away from the original draft DB code. Under that draft, it was not only a filter, but also a bit of a benchmark. Even schemes that did not adopt the fast track parameters would face having to justify adopting parts of their funding and investment strategy that did not follow those parameters. Under this revised code, it is no longer comply or explain, but for schemes not following the fast track, what TPR calls the bespoke approach, it will still be relevant and trustees should be aware of it. This is because if TPR has concerns with evaluation and seeks to use its powers to override the trustees and employer, known as its section 231 powers, then the fast track parameters are what TPR will apply to the scheme. This could lead to a jump in the contributions required from an employer. This will also now effectively be the fallback position for trustees in negotiations, the alternative to an agreed outcome. So we may well see trustees wielding this as a stick in discussions with the employer. The last point we wanted to cover was the paper trail that the new funding code requires. And I'm not going to go into the detail of every document, but there's a number of new formal documents required under the regulation, but also importantly, soft requirements coming out of what TPR says are its expectations. The funding code sets out many more areas where TPR will be looking for trustees to record the position adopted and the reasons for their decision, even if, the, even if it's not a document required by the legislation. Our specialist TPR investigation team has seen this in other areas of TPR action. The most helpful way to be ready to respond to TPR investigations is to have well documented the discussions and advice taken at the time. It's not only good practice, but it makes it easier to satisfy TPR that there is no need for action when you have good contemporaneous evidence. And it reduces the grounds for criticism, even if TPR does decide to use its powers. You can find out more in that area in our short guide from our TPR investigations team, which is available on our website or from your regular CMS contact. And I'll now hand back to Mark to close out this lawcast. Thanks, Simon. So if you've heard, we haven't reached the final ground rules yet, but those are our thoughts for the moment. We look forward to talking to you again once we have finality in both the funding regulations and the code. As I said, we're expecting those in around June. Further information on how we can help with regulation investigations can be found in our guide below and also in our CMS Pensions Law Appraised app, which you can download from the app store straight to your phones. Thanks everyone for listening and take care.